Okay, so um, I come from a machine learning background, so it's not common to discuss uh, people's papers, so I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure what, uh, what I'm supposed to do, but uh, here we go. Um, so as this is a, um, a session on causal inference, I'll tell you about sort of how people in machine learning think about this. Um, so it's, you know, um, before I joined Boot, I definitely did not know what counterfunctional, counter Factuals were, rather we were usually thinking of those in uh, terms of uh, probabilistic graphical models. So what I'll tell you about is, uh, is about, about those and then we'll come uh, at issues uh, that's sort of similar to what uh, Susan and uh, Victor talked about. So um, when we teach machine learning, uh, we usually discuss three different types of problems. So we talk about supervised learning, we talk about unsupervised learning and occasionally we learn about uh, reinforcement learning. So we've talked about a lot, or we heard a lot about supervised learnings, and uh, here you have both y's and x's, and you're trying to learn a conditional uh, mean. However, in, in a lot of problems, um, we also don't have y's, so we don't have a prediction problem per se, and so I would like to illustrate uh, through a lens of uh, one problem uh, um, how this uh, works out when we don't really have a uh, prediction problem. So we'll talk about uh, unsupervised uh, learning for the most part of this uh, discussion. So one, one problem um, that you talk about a lot about in, in machine learning classes are uh, probabilistic graphical models and in particular Bayes nets. So they are very, from statistical perspective, this is just a uh, convenient way to represent uh, conditional, well, to, to write down the joint distribution in terms of some simple objects, marginal and, and conditional distribution. So this avoids the fact that uh, in high dimensional setting, you have way too many parameters uh, to estimate. But also it's useful to think about these as, as causal models. So you can think of uh, um, that uh, flu and uh, allergy would, uh, would uh, cause sinus infection. And then if you have sinus infection, that may cause your nose running or having a headache. So depending on how you look at this, they may have interesting um, statistical interpretation or you can have uh, causal interpretation. Um, and so these are um, useful for learning causal um, relationships from observational data. So you can uh, push through um, a lot of um, machinery uh, like uh, learning and uh, inference and probabilistic graphical models to learn the structure of a uh, uh, base net. So of course this is impossible. So only you can, what you can do is you can learn a CP DAG or um, something that's uh, represents an equivalence class of uh, a models that represents the same conditional uh, independence assumptions. So another, w one way that you can learn these uh, uh, models is uh, a constraint-based approach, which essentially uses um, uh, conditional independence sets. So think about things that you probably know of as a PC algorithm or SGS algorithm that uh, starts from conditional imp independence tests, learns some uh, undirected graphical model, and then orients edges uh, afterwards. Um, so in particular, um, so what I want to talk about uh, next is how do we actually learn these uh, undirected graphical models, which are crucial for learning directed uh, causal structures. So the Markov networks um, usually are represented by a random vector X and an associated uh, graph G. So here we would have a uh, vertices V and uh, H set E. Every vertex corresponds to a particular coordinate of your random vector X. And the edges represent conditional independence relationships between these uh, nodes. So they are very useful for exploring associations between measured variables, but also they're useful for learning uh, causal structures um, between uh, variables. At least we can learn uh, some things, not everything, from the observational data. Um, and I guess like the, the one, one thing that I would like to point out here is that uh, rather than estimating one um, effect here, we're interested in understanding the whole system. So we don't have one parameter, um, like co causal treatment uh, uh, that we're interested in, but rather how things uh, interact as a, as a system as a whole. Um, so here in this setting, uh, an undergraduate graphical model, would uh, you would have uh, an edge that is missing from your graph if two coordinates are conditional independent uh, given everything uh, else. And so this uh, also has implications on your conditional distribution of, uh, of a node. Um, so you know, in machine learning, we usually think of uh, simplified models. So think about linear regression is uh, your first uh, supervised learning algorithm that you learn. 
So when you learn about graphical models, the Gaussian graphical model is the first uh, version of a graphical model that you learn. It's very convenient. You just need to learn mean and variance. Uh, so the first few moments specify the, the whole model. And it's very nice from uh, uh, sort of the structure of the model is that if you look at the inverse of the covariance matrix, the, something that's called precision matrix, zeros in this precision matrix tell you what the conditional independence assumptions are. Uh, another very convenient thing uh, that you like to think in uh, machine learning are uh, Ising models. So this is a, an example of, uh, of a model for discrete data. Um, and again, it's specified by the first two uh, moments. If you want to learn more about uh, great book is, for example, Aritz and all, Daphne Kohler and uh, Nir Friedman have an extensive uh, manuscript on, on these things. Again, one of the sort of prototypical tasks that we learn in, in the class in probabilistic graphical models is how do you learn a structure of it from uh, observational data. So the, the task is really that uh, you have n samples from some distribution and you'd like to learn this set of conditional independence assumptions that underlie the distribution. Why do we want to do that? Because maybe we're interested in association, so later on we want to orient the edges in, uh, in this uh, graphical model. Um, so there has been a lot of work um, starting um, probably from the 70s from an uh, influential paper by uh, um, Dempster. And the uh, review in statistical science was by Matthias Durton and uh, Perlman, which essentially tell you that in, in classical setting, the way you learn this uh, structure is by uh, running a lot of uh, tests for zeros in the precision matrix in, uh, accounting for multiple testing. Uh, discrete Markov networks are a little bit harder to learn and unless you have, unless you know something about the model, they can be hard uh, to learn. Um, and then come uh, the era of high dimensional data. So in the last 10 years, there has been a, uh, a plethora of papers. Here is just some of the papers that uh, have been published on how to learn a structure of an undirected graphical model in, in high dimensions, um, starting from um, learning a uh, high dimensional Gaussian graphical model uh, using uh, either penalized maximum likelihood or neighborhood selection procedure. Um, John Lafferty and uh, Pradeep Ray Kumar and, and uh, Martin Mary had an interesting paper on using uh, pseudo likelihood to estimate uh, structure of Ising model. And then uh, Pradeep's uh, group at uh, UT Austin did a lot of work on uh, extending these to other models of. Uh, um, exponential family graphical models and uh, Matthias Durton has a sort of a very recent overview um, of uh, results for both undirected and directed graphical models that uh, is going to appear. So how, how does this work? So if you are not familiar with this, maybe this is a um, nice overview of how these some of the neighborhood selection procedures work. So you start with an empty graph and you would like to learn the conditional independences. Um, so you start from node one, you run some penalized uh, Regression say that you're, if you're learning the Gaussian graphical model, you would run a regression of one node onto everything else, and that would give you a conditional independence assumption. You repeat this for every node, and you end up with a, a graph. And so what, what is lacking from this literature, and, and nicely ties to the last two talks, is that in this last 10 years of work, there is no really um, sort of guidance for scientists. So from whenever you talk to our colleagues in life science department, or neuroscience or social science, um, they'd ask us, you know, here we have some data, can you provide us a network summary of it? Uh, we tell them, okay, we are going to learn a structure for graphical model, here it, here it is, but what they ask for is, uh, well, how certain you are that the particular conditional independence is in the, in the data. So what is really lacking in this literature is that um, there's uh, not a good notion of um, sort of confidence intervals for the edge parameters in, in these models. And so this has been done in the last um, two years. So, well, not quite actually. The, the paper by Ren et al. Was, uh, appeared in an archive in 2013. So the, for the case of Gaussian graphical models um, that has worked in 2013, discussing how one can construct a um, asymptotically normal estimators for elements in the precision matrix. Um, and then there has been uh, extensions to other classes of, of models. Um, what I, um, I'm going to kind of illustrate, which is essentially an application of uh, techniques talked about, uh, that Victor talked about. 
is uh, we'll talk about a particular example of uh, learning a trans elliptical graphical model. So the problem with sort of this strand of literature is that we usually don't believe these parametric uh, assumptions. They are sort of there for convenience. So one way, okay, we need some convenience to learn a model, but can we actually relax it? Can we have a, a big, can we learn these uh, conditional independences on the much larger class of uh, distributions, not limited by a particular parametric family? So one such an extension are copula models. So uh, Han Liu, John Lafferty, and uh, Larry had a um, paper in 2009 in JMLR discussing how to learn non-paranormal graphical models. Um, here, a non-paranormal distribution is just a, maybe better known in econometrics as a Gaussian copula. Um, it allows you to model data that is not unimodal and has uh, heavy tails. Um, an extension done by Han Liu at uh, NIF's paper in 2012 was to trans elliptical distribution, which is essentially um, an elliptical copula model. Um, and uh, here, essentially what the elliptical copula is, you have monotonically increasing marginal transformations. You, um, once you apply these marginal transformations on the observed data, you get something that is elliptically distributed. So you can look at the level sets of your density. These are going to be spherical. Okay, so why is this interesting? Because you can model data that has heavy tail dependence. So not only do you have heavy tail data, but you can have uh, tail dependence between the different variables. Um, so this is useful because now we can have a um, robust way of learning graphical model. Um, in particular, what we have is that uh, we can learn something about the underlying uh, parameter without ever learning the infinite dimensional objects F1 through Fp. Um, so simply plugging in uh, an estimator of the, a robust estimator of the uh, covariance matrix that can be done by a nonlinear transformation of a candle tau can lead to a uh, consistent estimator of omega. However, this, while consistent in L2 norm, L, L infinity norm, is not going to be uh, asymptotically normal. So um, in a paper with a colleague in the stats department, we developed a procedure rocket. So as you've learned, naming your procedures is uh, extremely important. Um, robust confidence intervals via candle style, we propose a um, procedure that uh, essentially constructs um, a regular estimator for uh, element of the inverse of the covariance matrix. And it essentially relies on quantities that uh, are going to be estimable from the data. And as uh, in addition, as Victor talked about, this is going to be robust to uh, estimation model selection mistakes in uh, gamma A and uh, gamma B. Okay, so we can show that this procedure under some uh, conditions is going to be asymptotically normal. And what is key point here is that um, we can obtain these results under the same assumptions that are needed in the Gaussian setting without ever uh, requiring the data to uh, follow um, a multivariate normal distribution. So um, particularly if you're familiar with the literature on uh, Gaussian graphical models, you know that you can estimate uh, a neighborhood at uh, fast enough rate when the sample size is bigger than uh, sort of the sparsity times log p, um, and you have approximate sparsity for that uh, neighborhood coefficient. The, the caveat, I guess, the, the technical detail is that um, a lasso-like problem that uh, one needs to solve is not convex in this safe sense, but uh, results from uh, polling law and Martin Reynolds allow us to circumvent that uh, problem, or one could use a uh, Danzig selector or ideas from uh, Eric uh, Gauthier and uh, Tsibakov using a sort of self-tuned uh, Danzig selector, which is uh, a linear program even in, uh, well, it's a conic problem even when the sigma is not positive definite. Okay, so key take home message is that uh, in uh, this model we can have, uh, we can, we have optimality in some sense, so our estimator is minimax optimal in that you cannot achieve asymptotic normality unless some conditions are met. And these conditions are optimal. And uh, our estimator is able to match the lower bounds that they establish in the Gaussian model, while we don't really uh, need to specify that. So we have a robust uh, 
way of the estimating graphical models without specifying the, the normality. Um, okay, simulation studies. Um, I guess the point is that, that this works. So the data generating process is uh, if you have a lattice and we generate uh, uh, data from the elliptical copula model with uh, uh, where the scale parameter is t distribution with five degrees of freedom, so it's a very heavy tailed uh, distribution. And what you can show is that uh, you get sort of uh, historically normal estimators, whereas others uh, don't. Um, if the data, uh, okay, so, so also the, the coverage of these estimators is uh, close to nominal, um, and uh, that's good. What question either you may ask is that what happens when the data is, comes from normal and you're using this estimator that's not efficient for normality, you essentially still have nominal coverage but the, you pay the price in efficiency. We don't really know at the moment how to construct an estimator that's going to be um, uh, efficient but that's uh, sort of uh, direction for future work. So in summary, I guess, uh, uh, some of the techniques that Victor talked about can be used to um, come up with a semantically normal estimator in a class of uh, graphical models that are much bigger compared to Gaussian graphical models. Um, the confidence intervals have the right coverage and uh, I guess the practical recommendation is that whenever you're trying to learn uh, associations using Gaussian graphical models, you don't really pay any additional price by using something that's uh, robust to uh, estimation in a large class of distributions. We also have a result um, that extends this to dynamic models. So you have networks, conditional independence uh, structure that potentially changes over time. And here we can uh, establish a uniform uh, confidence bands for the sort of infinite dimensional parameter. The Kool-Aid assumption. So makes math work out, but uh, it's hard to verify in practice. So with uh, Larry and uh, Ale, we had a uh, paper in EJS that essentially says if you are not willing to make strong distributional assumptions, you cannot really have an uh, estimator that works in high dimensions. So really this sparsity assumption is crucial in uh, allowing us to obtain root and consistent estimators. And in addition, a recent paper by Tony Kai and uh, Guo to appear in analysis of statistics essentially shows that uh, we also ex require extreme sparsity. So again, looking at the uh, conditions here, we require the sample size uh, to be bigger than S squared log P, which tells you that uh, this works only in extremely sparse data generating uh, processes. So you have to have sparsity S smaller than root 10 over log P, which is a much stringent, more stringent assumption compared to the Lasso literature where you require the sample size to be, or the, the sparsity to be on the order of uh, n over log p. So models for which this data generating process for which this works is much more is stringent compared to where we require only uh, estimation. Um, okay, so this, this result was established under uh, Gaussian uh, linear regression model, but similar results could be extended to uh, graphical models. Um, so there are technical difficulties. So for example, um, there's theory that tells us how we should be picking the knobs. So for example, Lasso comes with a knob that's uh, called lambda and tells you how uh, much you're going to shrink your coefficients to zero. And so even though you know, there's a rate of lambda that we can set, um, in practice, Choosing constants in front of that uh, rate is still tricky. It's not quite clear that cross-validation is going to um, give us the right uh, answer. So cross-validation is usually used to um, choose a model that is going to predict well. However, if you're interested in uh, confidence interval, it's not quite clear how this is um, going to be um, useful. So I think there's still more work to be done on how to choose tuning parameters. So for example, also on the work in both forest, uh, causal forests, one needs to decide, uh, for example, how many um, variables that are going to be included in each uh, bootstrap sample, how big trees are, is one going to grow. And so it's um, something that's not clear to me is how does one chooses um, these tuning parameters so that you get uh, asymptotic normality. So even though you have asymptotic results 
uh, that tells you things are asymptotically normal. Um, in practice, you're dealing with finite samples and uh, asymptotic normality is just an approximation to what's happening in the real world. So how should you choose your tuning parameters so that you get that uh, normality approximate things well? Um, so there are some, I guess, extensions and ideas that uh, are probably worth discussing. So random forests are but one uh, tree ensemble. There are things like gradient boosting uh, trees where that work better for predictive performances. So it's uh, not clear whether those could be extended to also work better for um, inference. In, in the context of uh, um, results for causal forests, the results are established for, for one X. So if you want to use, um, if you want to learn about the treatment at multiple X's, uh, we would probably need to extend those results to hold uniformly over the space of uh, X. So it's not clear how technically difficult that is. We also, in, in many cases, we have um, asymptotic results. It's not quite clear uh, for the finite samples how close are we to these uh, asymptotic results. So the results of uh, sort of various scene type results would be quite useful. Something that would tell us um, how close are we to the limiting um, results. So in practice, you know, bias is high order term, but still it's going to affect us. So when is it the case that um, that is really negligible. Um, so in Victor's work um, in the double machine learning, we usually need to specify how the treatment is related to um, uh, X's. So maybe one would say that this is a sparse model is, is appropriate, or maybe a random forest or deep learning uh, model would be appropriate for representing a relationship between uh, the treatment and, and X's. And it's not quite clear how can we do that adaptively. So somehow economist or statistician or somebody needs to tell us that the relationship is uh, sparse or approximately sparse or can be represented as a combination of uh, trees. So I think the goal of machine learning is really to substitute statistician or econometricians with the machine. And until we can uh, actually you know, avoid that, it's uh, still a lot of work needs to be, be done. And so, this last part I, I just um, added uh, before, uh, a few minutes before the talk. So yesterday Jennifer Hill from NYU talked about um, uh, competitions for learning uh, causal effects. And so in, in practice, we don't observe causal effects, but um, uh, when I took, uh, for example, John's class um, 702, um, we, there are many ways of how you can verify uh, machine learning algorithms. So one is you have a data set, you apply it, and it works. So this is one way of verifying. You can prove theorem about your machine learning method under a lot of assumptions it works. But really also you can run uh, extensive simulations. So I think one uh, really good direction that uh, Jennifer uh, talked about yesterday was um, that uh, you can run competitions and generate a large number of data generating uh, processes and then you can test. You have ground truth and uh, you can test various different uh, procedures and you can give recommendations to practitioners uh, what you should uh, be using in uh, whether you're, depending on where your data lies in the landscape of different uh, data generating processes because it's unclear that we have universally valid uh, procedure that's always going to, to work. So this, these are some of my sort of thoughts on uh, possible extensions. Thanks. Didn't really talk about is sort of how um, you know the this whole like discovering causal relationships relates to what we were talking about. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting. You know, one experience we have, and kind of when I say I'm doing causal inference to machine learning people, they assume that I would be out there trying to discover causal relationships, and they're kind of surprised that that has nothing to do with what we're doing, and we don't really use that interested in doing it. Um, and so there's sort of a question of why. Um, is it just that we're kind of short-sighted and we just need to be educated and if someone came and, and told us all about this other lovely work that we would see the error of our ways and go back and try to discover causal relationships in our data sets. And I think, um, you know, kind of some of the economists are giggling because we generally wouldn't. Um, and that's mostly because like we have like we spend years and have lots of fights over like just finding one causal relationship or one exclusion restriction. You know, so for something like the examples that we gave, like the, the 401k savings or like um, 
you know, the, the women's labor force participation, like to think, okay, I'm gonna figure out the causal effect of having more kids on, you know, being in the workforce. Like I'm not just gonna take like some big census data set and discover, you know, the 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 exclusion restrictions that help me figure that out. So while what we do is in some sense it's very unattractive because it requires it's so manual and it's so specific to each problem and it requires so much work and so it doesn't scale. It's also the case that even when we do all this work on one specific causal relationship, half the people still don't believe it. Um, and so, uh, so it's just there's a little bit of a different kind of um, emphasis on the domains. It's not to say that like one thing is right and one thing is wrong, but just when you want to go out and discover which genes cause cancer or something, that's like a very different class of problems than like trying to figure out if having a third child, you know, changes your labor force outcomes. Well, so I, th I think like uh, the, the one, one point is that you have much better understanding what to ask. When you talk to life scientists, they don't, they're not quite interested in, they, they don't even know what question, what scientific question is really interesting. They are out there to find anything interesting, not particular um, <laughs> answer to a particular question. So I think really maybe these tools are useful to different uh, problem domains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's a, it's just, they're, they're very well suited for different domains. Now, it may be that, that there are some places that we're going to figure out in, in economics where they are really useful and we just haven't thought of it yet. But I also think that it's sort of not an accident in some sense which tools a, a community kind of gravitates towards because they tend to gravitate towards the tools that are most interesting for their problems. So it's just, it's, it's, it's just kind of, I think, given that this conference is about the intersection, what's, I think what's kind of interesting is that even though there's all this discussion, we haven't actually found a lot of intersection with the first part of your talk and economics. Um, well, sort of like I think uh, the talk that we saw in, in, uh, on the networks, so for example, using uh, rather than explaining variance, is potentially using conditional independence relationships to understand uh, realized volatility might be an interesting uh, opportunity to, to explore. Unfortunately, I, I did not get that data earlier, but you know, maybe we can talk after uh, the... That's right, so I think there's like some subdomains where it could... For example, uh, finance, grandeur causality, like learning uh, a lot about uh, essentially structure of var varying out the regressive models could fall quite easily in, um, in this framework.